Sorry, it'll stop recording there for a minute. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, what else do we want to talk about? Uh, let's see here. There are a couple of questions. You're going to have a couple of graphs to interpret. And they deal with this, they're, or maybe probably about three, dealing with the production possibilities model. And what is the production possibilities model all about? It's this idea of modeling production between goods and one good and another. So you've got <laughs> production of good A, good B. And remember that that on, all this model is really simply doing is it's it's illustrating the idea of a trade-off. If I do more of one thing, I give up something of the other. In this case, it's production. So if I produce more of good A, I've got to give up some of the production of good B because I can't do the equivalent amount of both. And so that's the trade-off. And the value of the trade-off is what we call opportunity cost. And so know what that term opportunity cost is, okay? It's the value of the foregone off opportunity. Now, by the way, we're gonna elaborate that on a, a bit later in the class and, and put some real dollar figures to it. Because I think what's important to know is that it's not just theoretical. These are real costs. These are real costs that we have to account for, okay? Now also that on the production possibilities, if you're operating inside the curve, it's considered inefficient, right? Because you're not utilizing all the inputs effectively. And so as a result, it's inefficient condition. You're, you're underproducing probably both good A and good B, or however you want to know that, guns and butter, or whatever the combination of goods are that, that we're underproducing. So that's inefficient. And then anything that's outside that curve to the right, again, to the right is outside it, is considered to be unattainable presently because the resources just aren't there to produce that level of output. Over time, as the, as the production system grows, it should, it would allow you to catch up, but in the very short run, that's not the case, okay? Okay, so you wanna know about the production possibilities curve and what that's about. Also know about scarcity and what scarcity is. We talked about also this idea of the um, economizing problem in economics and what that is. We said the economizing problem is this conflict between, and there's a slide in week one on the PowerPoint package, it's the conflict between uh, scarce, scarcity and unlimited wants. And we make the assumption that we, we have unlimited wants. And um, whether or not that's um, something you all agree with or not, that is a, it's a presumption that we're starting with in economics. Okay, so know uh, what scarcity is. Okay, uh, let's see here. Um, okay, questions about demand and supply are going to be pretty critical here. Know what the configuration it is downward sloping generally, supply upward sloping, and know what would cause shifts. Not movements along these curves, whether it's demand or supply, but rather shifts when the entire curve moves to the right or left, right being an increase, left being a decrease. And those are called the determinants of demand, in the case of demand, determinants of supply, in the case of supply. And so there are a number of questions where you want to identify what's happening. So for instance, it may be a situation which um, Somebody buys more of, uh, the price of butter is rising, so they buy more margarine. So what's being illustrated there? Substitution, right? So that would be the, the, the price of a substitute. Price of margarine is less expensive than the price of butter. And so as a result, butter and margarine are considered substitutes for one another. And remember what substitutes are, they're just goods that can be swapped out for another in a purchase decision, as opposed to a complement, which is our two goods that go together, in the, in the purchase for whatever reason. It, it makes sense that they go together or whatever. Also know about another pair of goods we put together called normative, uh, I'm sorry, normal goods and inferior goods. Normal goods are those goods that are so-called normal because they demand goes the way we would expect them to go. That is they track directly with income. So if incomes are rising, we demand more of these goods. All luxury goods are normal goods because as incomes rise, people demand more luxury goods. As incomes fall, they demand fewer of those. But luxury goods are only one subset of normal goods. Most goods are normal goods. Most goods are normal goods. There are goods that are inferior goods, however, they're just the opposite. As incomes go up, we demand less of them. As incomes go down, we demand more of them. And those are goods that uh, they're called inferior. And maybe it's, I know people get the idea that it's a qualitative you know, assessment or judgment being made. Maybe that's the case. Maybe that's not, but that, that is the term that's used. Uh, the big thing that we want to track is the demand for those goods in relation to changes in income, okay? 
and you're pairing goods together that are opposite one another, like substitutes and complements. We're going to expand that a bit later in the course, and we we add a whole bunch of other goods a bit later. Okay. Uh, let me see here. They know about this idea of the the moving along the demand curve, moving along the supply curve, and know that that is due to a change in price and only a change in price. So movements along the demand curve or movements along the supply curve are due only to changes in price. And then know about what the, what the law of demand is and what the law of supply is. Remember, we, only, we have very few laws in economics and really only two that we can that make sense, the law of demand and the law of supply. And that is the law of demand says that the price of a good goes up, the quantity of demand it goes down, the price of a good goes down, the quantity of demand it goes up. And it's just the opposite of this for the law of supply. The price and quantity go in the same direction, either up or down, or as opposed to they go opposite directions in the case of demand. And this, this is why you have a negative slope on the demand curve it's because they move inverse of one another. So, and you're not going to have to compute slopes or anything like that. There's no calculation on this particular exam. Um, you know, a bit later, we'll give us some lighter, lighter calculations. But right now, this is more just identifying what's, what's going on. Okay. Uh, okay, let me see here. Uh, I'm getting, I don't have a whole lot more to talk about. Just this idea of these, these shifters of supply, shifters of demand. Oh, and then know what happens with equilibrium. This is something I went over today. So if I said that, uh, okay, um, that there are five automakers and two of them leave the market for whatever reason, what happens to supply? Well, That'd be a leftward shift in supply. It's a decrease in overall supply. So just kind of know what these scenarios are. And here, I think it would be helpful to read the text uh, in its discussion about these shifters of demand and supply. If for no other reason than the fact that it might give you a little bit of context under these, because the list I gave you of these and shifters of supply that we call the determinants of both of those, there are probably some others we haven't included. I know one, one that is very topical right now, that's interest rates. Uh, that would be a big shifter of demand. I didn't include it because, you know, it's, it's you know, just in the interest of brevity, but, but there are other examples of things that can move and uh, it can, can move those, those curves to the right or to the left, okay? Um, and so there are a number of questions dealing with this idea of, of choosing between substitutes and choosing between complements and knowing what complements are. So, you know, hot dogs and hot dog buns are complements. Um, but hot dogs and hamburgers are substitutes, right? Hot dogs and hamburgers are substitutes. But hot, dog, hot dogs and hot dog buns go together. So those are complements. Know what those goods are and why that makes sense. Complements are simply goods for which the demand is related to the demand for some other good because it just simply uh, makes sense that, that that would be the case, okay? Um, you want to know about, I, I mentioned this a second ago, but I, I want to make sure everyone's clear. Know that a, a demand curve is downward sloping, okay? D, demand down, right? So it's negatively sloped. That's, that's why it's an inverse relationship between price and quantity. And then, um, and like her being upward sloping. We went over and did a lot in, in the appendix A with regard to the math here, and, and you're not going to be asked to compute any slopes or whatnot, but you do want to know what these are about because slope does make a big difference, especially as we get a little bit deeper and we get into other kind of functions, particularly cost functions. I think it's going to be a big issue there. Okay. There are a few questions dealing with factors of production. We talked about what those were. We said that that, that in the most basic um, sort of illustration of an economy, it's, it's producers sort of getting their arms around inputs labor materials and then producing outputs and nice shiny packages that you can put on the shelf. What about those inputs and how do we categorize them in, in these four categories of land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial ability? And know what those are. Land is really a euphemism for natural resources that are things that come to us by virtue of our being on the same planet together. Water, timber, plants, that sort of thing. Uh, labor is what we call human capital. Remember what that is? It's the idea of you know the, the people bring to the labor market skills and experience and whatnot. Capital refers to something very, even though we use the term capital with labor, capital in its original meaning here is physical goods used in production. And then entrepreneurial ability is that, that sort of X factor that 
you know, how do we, uh, how are businesses formed? What is the risk taking and whatnot? We're gonna, if we have time, toward the very end of the semester, we're gonna do a little bit more discussion about risk and, and how risk is measured, which I think a lot of people find fairly interesting, okay? Uh, know what equilibrium is and know what out of equilibrium conditions are, shortages and surpluses. We went over that today. Um, and again, that's the, the limit as to what we're gonna get into in chapter three. I've said this a couple of times, and you know, we'll pick up the remainder of that on Monday. Um, and then uh, let me see here. Extra time, right? I, I uh, thought maybe I would uh, take a little bit longer, but I think that I've covered pretty much everything you need to know. Um, as to the exam itself, you've got about 90 minutes to do it. You can just, I would just recommend that you take it whenever you're comfortable with it, where you're probably going to be uninterrupted, quiet place, going to a cup of coffee, whatever, whatever makes you happy, you know, uh, we can relax and, and take the time to, to study it and, uh, and get it done. To view this exam, it'll be uh, like a week after the fact, because there are, we do allow, unless everyone takes it, if there are no makeups that are pending, then I'll just make it available for everybody to go and look at the answers, right answers, wrong answers, everything. But there's a week of makeup period in case somebody misses the exam for whatever reason. And if you are unable to take the exam this week, or this second half of the week, let me know, and then we'll make it available next week. Once everyone's had a chance to take it, then we'll make it available so you can go in and see. Because I know it, people do like to see how well they did. I, I get that. And I know that there's always this conflict between I, faster feedback is better than slower. And I, I get that. I, I know everyone wants to see how well they did, like right away. You know, I, I was in college for 10 years. And I, I know exactly what you're saying. So there's a pull here because I do want to accommodate those people who need to do a makeup for whatever reason, because, you know, our students are busy, you know, we, you know, a lot of you have jobs and families and lives, things do come up. And so as a result, uh, that is sort of there. Now, if you're just dying to absolutely know how you did, gosh, number this one question about whatever, just get with me individually. I'm sure we can get you an answer on that. And we'll leave you, you hanging if that's the case, but, uh, but I will make it available to you. So if you have problems with exams of a sort of a technical nature, um, and I know that not, Brightspace is not everyone's cup of tea, but it does seem to be pretty stable compared to the old system we used before that. Uh, but if you get kicked out for whatever reason, you can't get back in, send me an email over the weekend and I'll just, I'll go in and I'll probably have to take your attempt out and start over. Um, I hate to say that because sometimes people get deeply into an exam. Often it happens is they, they get up and walk away and leave for 30 minutes and run down the street or get, answer a phone call or whatever, and then they get frozen up because their internet connection freezes or our server, whatever. So I, I don't advise you to do that. If it happens, it happens. Um, and I may have to reset it for you. So, you know, I would sort of discourage you from, you know, trying to be interrupted. I know that's easier said than done, especially for those of us who have uh, little kids running around, you know, that sort of thing. So it does happen, okay? Um, okay, other questions? Anybody on the Zoom call? Okay, it'll be available sometime on Thursday. So let me, I'm just sort of putting the finishing touches on it. And again, you can get to it under content, or under coursework or through uh, the uh, course coursework content, which is the, the weekly module. Either way is fine. And uh, you'll be able to see your score right away. It'll auto grade. So you get your score, you just won't be able to see the answers. Okay. All right. Well, if anybody has any questions in the meantime, between now and Sunday night, feel free to get with me. Email is a good way to do it. I'll get back to you as soon as I'm possibly able to. And so have a great rest of your day. See you next, next week.